Facebook. Hi guys, thanks again for joining us. Um, so we are live on YouTube as well. So the folks at YouTube can hear us clearly. So, uh, good evening, guys. Where's everybody from? So today's webinar session is really on how to market shrimps and crabs which is uh, quite important considering that you might one day have to sell some of your products restaurants. Right, so the example that I'll be giving you today is more related towards uh, what are we doing on our side and how are we differentiating ourselves from other products out there and what services do we actually provide uh, to consumers. Right, so we have a bit more guys on, uh, on YouTube already. Today is really on marketing. Um, so I was at a conference the other day, and you know, actually a lot of people actually commented that aquaculture companies tend to be overly focused on all the part and tends to get the basics in terms of how to market your product. So this is not uncommon. Um, typically in Southeast Asia, it's very common trim or the market to be sort of uh, trying to dump products out there in the market for a very cheap price just to get rid of it but it happens a lot of times um, usually farms uh, will not take any effort in trying to sell some of them directly to the restaurant uh, because of the large production volume um, but that's something that you should explore definitely So how does your product differentiates from other people's products? So that's really important. And, uh, most importantly, how does it differentiate with regards to products shipping in imported, for example, uh, Indonesia or Vietnam? So what does your indoor farming really give you competitive advantage when you start work uh, with restaurants and you work with consumers? Um, or retail outlets. So that's a really important point to look at. I'll be starting in another five more minutes. Can everybody on YouTube hear me clearly? Hi Vince. Thanks again for joining us today. So I see that you're from KL, so I'll be sharing some of the prices uh, for mud crabs in KL as well. You know, feel free to you know, go ahead and comment on you know, what are the current prices that you see out there in the market. Um, what's the shrimp price that you, you get to buy from retail outlets. So you know, feel free to just write some numbers down. Right, so for our next webinar session, uh, so for those who are tuning in uh, for now, the next webinar session will be on the 2nd of June. So my colleague Shikim will be bringing 
you through what we call feed management in uh, shrimp farms. So uh, this is really important part. So for those who are planning to start up your bio flock, it's really important that you join this webinar to ensure that you have a good understanding of the of the requirements in terms of feed management, right? In the bio so the webinar will, will have will take place on the second of June, right? Um, and it will be held at eight thirty GMT plus eight. So do mark up, do mark down your calendar. We will be advertising the event shortly. So that will probably give you some heads up on the type of feed management that you have doing on your prep trim farms. Right, so we'll be starting in five minutes time. So the guys on YouTube, where is everybody from? Uh, you can you know drop us a few pricing, if you know any right uh, about your current mud crab prices in your location. Uh, some prices on shrimp will be good. Some prices on uh, crabs would be good. So to just give us an understanding, I'll be sharing some of our pricing. Uh, at the moment, I have the latest pricing for mud crabs. Um, so for those who are not aware, um, the past month was um, was a particularly tough month for traders who were in the mud crab industry because basically what happened was you had a lot of demand from China which drove up the, which drove up the prices in Indonesia. So traders were basically stuck in the middle, especially if you are serving a um, local consumer for example in Malaysia because at the end of the day, not all Malaysian consumers are willing to pay a premium. Definitely not what uh, China is willing to pay. So as a result, you know, traders are being squeezed because they can't raise their prices between restaurants and they can't source at a cheaper price. Right? So prices have actually started to soften up this week. Uh, and we expect them to continue to soften down towards the month of July and August because you will also have a bit more production from as, uh, other places like Bangladesh, right? So now with the restricted MCO, we do see some of the trade routes being affected, uh, especially we see this in Singapore where whereby there's not crabs that are coming in from India. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. Um, so do take note. Um, now because of the pandemic, uh, guys have to be, you know, take note and watch out for potential market openings. Um, just to give you an example, last year's May, during when the pandemic started in February, we actually had quite a good month over May and June because when most of the supply was cut off due to the restrictions in logistics, we were the only few crab farms or crab fattening facility that had inventory for another 30, to 30 days to more than a month. So we were the only supplier that had crabs where all of the other traders were stuck. So that's really important to, to take note uh, in terms of supply availability, um, especially when dealing with a product like crabs. So for shrimp, uh, not so much affected because uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, we are all shrimp exporting countries. So with the current pandemic, yes, uh, we do see a decline in some of the demand over in China side so that actually drove down the pricing a little bit but in terms of local domestic market we, we do see some of these products that were originally intended for export they are flooding some of the market right now so it's not uncommon for the guys in KL to tell me you know we had a, someone who kept, who's, drive, who's driving this lorry around KL PJ area trying to deliver tiger shrimp at 30 counts per kilo at uh, about 50 plus ringgit so are the, are the farmers really selling at a loss? Uh, probably if you work out their production cost, they would they are actually still not selling at a cost uh, at a loss, right? Uh, definitely not at cost price. So so that's important to take note. Uh, although they might have a lot of blood in the market in the sense that they are not able to sell some of the streams overseas. So I mean they are stuck in a catch twenty two position whereby they can't really uh, they can't really sell. Uh, but you know they, and they have to continue feed the stream. If not, they will lose the stock, right? 
So Vince actually said that, you know, uh, is Philippines a good place to get stock? Um, the answer is if you're based in PJ, KL, I think no, right? Okay, the prices in Philippines are actually already very, very high. Um, definitely not what Malaysian customers are willing to pay for. So you could just fly over to, you can just fly over to Manila, right? You'll head down to any trading facility. So usually in Manila, that is, it's usually concentrated in an area very close to the airport, right? Or if you want to even go down to like, for example, Mindanao or Iloilo, right? You can go and source crabs there. But what you'll realize that their farm gate price is already almost more expensive than what we are actually Malaysians, uh, we, I would say B2B restaurant price at, right? So Malaysia's uh, mud crab price is actually considered quite low in comparison to places like Vietnam. So look at Vietnam as well. Um, Vietnam for 300 gram size crabs, it will be 30 US dollars in Ho Chi Minh City. And this is before getting out to the plane, traveling down to Malaysia. So um, Malaysia, all this time we've been lucky. Uh, we've been lucky in the sense that we've enjoyed cheap crabs mainly from Indonesia. And that's about to change. So so in this webinar, I'll, I'll try to share with you some of the problems that you know, a lot of our clients face and how are we helping them with some of our systems. Right? Um, Right, so for those who, are, who, who don't know me yet, I'm Yit. So basically, I'm the principal consultant for Ras Aquaculture. My role in this company really is to design and operate our system, and uh, we do design, operate biofloc systems, and we are also quite well versed in wastewater. But although, you know, it seems to be a to be lot of people that we are from a very technical background, but we actually went down to each restaurant in the township that we live in and start to sell crabs. So that's how we started. Um, right now, where we are at, we actually have about 80 to 85% market share of all of the crabs that are sold in Kuang. And Kuang is a landlocked city, so you can just look at sub on Google Map, you'll see that we are 90 km away from the coast. So obviously, this business model makes sense. Uh, and obviously, we have also replicated this in, for example, Brunei, that's one. Uh, we are working on another case in Cambodia to replicate this business model. Right? So just to give you a heads up, uh, what are some of the products that are currently produced via indoor aquaculture? So we of course have some hybrid grouper. Uh, so some of the guys in Malaysia do have a RAS system or semi ras system whereby they are producing groupers. Um, we have a client that produces hybrid grouper smack right in land-based conditions. So this is land-based mean without being close to seawater, full RS system for hybrid grouper. So mud crabs, uh, I'm sure you are familiar. Uh, Vaname as well, so we produce Vaname with our biofloc systems. Um, there were some talks on you know the popularity of using indoor aquaculture systems to do crayfish. So this is what we call the freshwater lobsters, originally from Australia, uh, which somehow got into Malaysia. Actually, they're invasive species, so do take note that when you're farming this. So there were a lot of demand. There were a lot of so-called anticipated demand in Malaysia, mainly because of China, Chinese um, residentials that were staying in-house, right? But crayfish doesn't have a lot of, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't sing well with our local preference, right? I'm pretty sure it will not be a product that sings well in Philippines and Indonesia as well, because crayfish, uh, if you have a crayfish and you have a crab side by side, I think it's a pretty clear cut case whereby the crab will obviously win in terms of meat texture and in terms of sweetness and if you don't compare crayfish with baname as well, so you know obviously it's a not a sort not so sought after product uh as compared to my crabs and baname, right? So of course we also have tilapia that are actually being cultured in RS systems. A lot of people are doing that, a lot of people are doing some aqua slash aquaponic systems. A lot of people are doing them in ponds, so you have a very high cost, uh, you have a wide variety of, um, of production methods for tilapia, right? So guess what, the tilapia price today at farm gate for 250 grams is about 657 tops, right? So that's important to take in mind and how are people actually selling this tilapia, right? So today I'll just cover mud crab and balame because that's what we are actively playing a part in, right? So we understand the market relatively well. Um, we know how to distribute, we know how to sell, we know how to price things properly. So this is really important. Okay, so first things first. Um, so let's first look at crabs. 
So perhaps first thing I would like to understand, I would like to explain to everybody is with regards to the pricing, right? How does pricing work across, um, for example, farmers, right, or traders, right, which will then sell into restaurants, and restaurants will have to require a markup to sell to the end consumer. So that's everything about pricing. Second thing is we have to understand substitution, right? So what do we mean by substitution of other products? Because at the end of the day, we can't just raise the price up to, up to the ceiling because consumers will always have an option to switch into a, another goods. So what are these available products that restaurants or consumers might switch into, right? So and if that product is very, very cheap, for example, it doesn't make a lot of sense for consumer to keep continue buying a crab for a hundred dollars US dollars per kilo, right? So there needs to have some comparison where consumer can decide or choose from, right? And we have to look at that substitution. And we have to also have to understand whether the crab is a predominantly a B2B market or B2C market, right? So for those who are listening to this webinar, uh, you know, probably give me a heads up if you have actually bought a crab before back home, clean, clean it, cook it yourself, and you know, serve it for dinner, right? So um versus a number a versus shrimp, for example. So you can, you know, give me some heads up, then we can see from the numbers that how many people have actually tried that, right? So obviously for a Malaysian, your typical Malaysian consumers, I would think maybe one out of 20 people can actually only do that, right? So, and judging from the fact that a lot of city dwellers like bins, not too sure whether is that a common thing, um, a common thing to do in KL, but definitely not common for a family in KL. Uh, so that's one aspect to continue to look at as well. So some of the challenges faced by clients, so you, when you are dealing with restaurants or consumers, you really have to understand what problems do they have apart from you know, quality, apart from pricing. So try to solve their problem and see whether they are willing to pay you a premium for it, right? So that's really important. So guess what? So this is the last week most updated price for my crab. So um, right now, H3, okay, so when you are dealing with my crab, we always talk in terms of H3, H4, H5, H6, H7. So the prefix H means hitam, right? If this is the Malay language. And 3, three means 300, 5 means 500 to 600. H7, for example, means 700 to 8. So that's normally how we talk between traders or, or, or suppliers or, or talking to fishermen. So nobody talks in terms of L, XL, M, S. That is a, that is a restaurant term, right? Traders to traders, we always talk to M, H3, H4, H5, right? This is with specifics to Malaysia and Indonesia and Singapore, right? In Philippines, you guys have another different uh, nomenclature. You guys use the M3, M4, M5, whereby the number also indicate the same thing. Sometimes you have OS, you have some specific species, right? The only countries that I see might use MLXL is Sri Lanka and India, right? Um, so that's not so clear on that side. So for our side in this region, usually we talk in terms of H3, H4, H5, right? So the last week pricing at the moment, so this B2B price is the price that I'm actually sending the goods to consumer. So for 300 gram size, it's actually retailing for 55 to 65 ringgit per kilo, right? So it's per kilo price, yeah? So this is really important, right? So when you're going to H5 range, which is H5, 500 to 600, right? Gram size, we are actually going for the market 75 to 85. So why is there a huge big drop in terms of why 75 and not a particular number, right? Because quality in this matter plays a role. Because you can sell someone at 55 where most of your crabs are not really that full, right? Whereas you can sell somebody at 65 where your product is really, really full. So that's a question of quality as well. So for our overseas listeners, right? How to convert RM to US dollars is just simply multiplying by 4. So 300 gram would be about 15 US dollars per kilo. This is the price that I'm selling to restaurants. So look at Ho Chi Minh's price. I'm sure it's really higher than this, right? H5 is 500 gram, which is actually going for 20 US dollars per kilo, right? So, so that's the price that I normally sell to restaurants, right? So typically, how much do restaurants actually mark up, okay? So everybody will tell you in the restaurant business, you have to pay for rental, manpower, blah, blah, blah. So typically, they will do a one-to-one -one markup, right? So that means if they buy something at 60, they'll start at 120, typically, right? 
So if you look at the budgets out there in the market, I actually have extracted this image from all the restaurants in uh, Bangsa. I will not tell you who is not get into trouble, right? So they actually uh, some of the prices uh, that I, I gathered out there is typically my clients would buy from us at 50 to 65 range and they'll sell about 110, right? So you can just do the work out the maps and you can see it's about 40 40% gross. Yeah. So um what about 500 gram size, right? So 500 gram size is actually, they're selling it, they're buying for 80 and they're actually selling at 160. Okay, so this is the corresponding pricing in US dollar, which is 28 and 35 US dollars. Right, so this is where it gets really, really interesting. So if you look at this menu, it says that it's 69.90 then with a small one in US, right? So this is where consumers usually get a bit confused. Right, so they'll think, oh, it's only $69.90 per kilo. You know, it's very cheap. Let's order. But don't forget that you are buying crabs in terms of pieces, right? Whereas it is actually retailed in terms of kilo. So if you work out the mess, it's 0 69.9. If assuming this crab is half a kilo, you actually pay 140 ringgit per kilo. So this is this method of selling is really, really very unique to, to restaurants in the way they run their promotions and Offers, right so you usually how I work backwards if I'm seeing they have a promotion like this I'll work backwards and try to calculate my cost that I have to sell them because sometimes you realize that you can't have a crab that is too big for example you can't sell this guy a crab that's 700 grand because once you work out the mats they'll, they'll start losing money right so a lot of times is understanding what promotion they're trying to sell and working backwards to try to figure out what prices you have to sell them while retaining their margin right so you might say 45%, 42% gross margin for restaurants that don't do anything, just buy our crabs and you know cook it and sell it. But you have to understand from a restaurant's perspective that they can't pay so much for ingredients because their highest overhead is actually manpower and rental, right? So that's their business model. And most importantly, right, restaurants also have to include 42 is not net because they also have to include Things like oil, ingredients, blah, blah, blah. If you are cooking salted egg, I'm not too sure whether you guys actually check the salted egg prices. They are not exactly very cheap as well. So you try to factor that into account and, you know, back calculate some of the margin. But most importantly, what are restaurants most afraid of? They are most afraid of mortality. For example, if they buy 10 kilos of crab from you, right, and they need, they are the kind of restaurants that requires to present their crabs to consumers, for example. So for example, let's say if you for those guys in Malaysia, let's say if you go to Fatty Crab today, you will only go to Fatty Crab when you already have that mindset of going to Fatty Crab to have enjoy crabs, right? So usually for this kind of restaurants, they don't really have to show you that you know, you know, they don't have to explain to you oh, today I have live crabs, you know, because you already have that intention. It's a question of how many do you want. But if you go to some other restaurants that do not usually serve crab, do not have their signature dish as a crab. And you approach them and tell them, you know, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm here for a meal, what can you recommend? Also tell them, oh, today I have some very, very fresh crab from, right? So they require the crabs to be alive and they require them to have a longer shelf life. Because once you have one crab that die, I'm not too sure whether your 42% cost margin can cover for the other crab, right? You probably have, you need to sell three crabs to cover one that, that was so this is a really important concept to look at. The restaurants that you deal with, what are they looking for? Okay, because not all restaurants can afford to pay for that mortality, right? Because once they have one or two that die, you know, they can't pay for it. And don't be surprised that, you know, um, the restaurant themselves don't understand whether they're losing money or not. Because they are paying everything in, in cash, right? And you know, if you give them terms, they'll be just running their business, but they'll be running at a loss. And by the time you realize it, oops, you can't collect, recoup your payment. So that's really important to understand in terms of uh, mortality and what do they require. So if you look at some of the products out there in the market, let's say today crabs is at a hundred US dollars per kilo. Will consumers still continue to pay crabs? To buy crabs? The answer is no. Right, at least not in Malaysia, because we have other options, right? I can always go down to the market and get some flower crabs. Yes, they are not alive. Yes, they are not as big as the mud crabs, but they, they taste all pretty. They, they taste okay, right? In terms of sweetness, they still taste. They still they still fair pretty 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 well. So we also have the crucifix crabs, which looks like this, right? So which has like a cross behind, uh, behind them, right? So this is also quite 
quite popular in Malaysia and it's, they're, they're very cheap right they're about <clears throat> and retail price is about 20 to 30 ringgits per kilo which is about 7 US dollars so half the price or one third the price of wood crack we also have other options we also have cram uh, what we call this can crack meat right so we also have people that are trying to sell you claws of these crabs. So I'm not too sure if anybody actually sit down and wondered where does this crab claw come from? Why do they exist in the first place? Right? So because frozen crabs actually retail for a price much lower than a mud crab, a live one. So why do we have all this, right? So I'm not going to tell you the answer. I'm sure everybody could have figured it out by now, right? So most importantly, we have to understand mud crabs are they a one or they're really just a need, right? Or they're just a need or really just a one. So we have to understand that consumers have an option, right? So this is really important part to keep, okay? So if we look at distribution, right? So there's a really good point about mud crabs. So number one, uh, well, you can see that how crabs are being packed in baskets like this on the right. So Obviously, they can be transported dry without water. I'm not too sure whether you guys actually understand the impact of this. Meaning to say that you are actually saving a lot of money while trying to transport them. It's not like fish, it's not like shrimp, whereby you need water to transport. So, mud crabs can be typically packed in 20 kilo a box and they are typically sit on airplanes and they are airflown everywhere. Right? Life. You don't usually see that with shrimp. Uh, we don't see shrimp taking airplanes and flying through Asia or flying through Malindo to get to another location, but we see that a lot with crabs. Yeah? Crabs can usually survive out of water for one day. Right? Maximum, I would say, is about two days. Right? But your mortality will definitely increase exponentially, exponentially given that you do not have access to seawater. So imagine now, if you buy the crabs from, let's say, Vince's case, right? you buy it from Philippines, Somebody on Philippines packs it on the airplane, you know, ships it to KL, right? If Vince doesn't have a facility, all right, or he doesn't have a, a location to, to sell or to, to, to store the crabs, for example, he will be forced to quickly sell off his inventory, right? Because if he doesn't do that, he's going to lose a lot of money, right? And that mortality can be in the range of 20 to 30%. Okay, so that's really important. So... Traders tend to move products very, very quickly. The key is now to go build big distribution uh, channels, for example, you go, go sign a deal with Fatty Crab or go sign a deal with No Name Seafood or Jumbo, which you can offer quickly, right? Then you, you know, that is the, the get that volume up so that you can run your logistics smoothly, then you build other volumes on the side with a higher price. So that's what is typically done, okay? What about the restaurant that buys this product? If they don't have an aquarium, there will also be Force to sell quickly, right? That's normally what they would do. But that's a misconception, right? So what do you think the traders will do when they start finding crabs that are actually dead in the process? So number one is the extraction of crab meat to, to do other byproducts like the one you saw earlier, which are crab sauce. Usually if restaurants have dead crabs, they will not just throw it as well. They will use it for other things like crab fried rice or used to boil this crab corn soup, which is also another popular dish. Right? So restaurants and traders really need to get creative in terms of finding ways to recruit sources and to improve the yield right? and not to avoid a lot of wastage. Okay? So guess what? So this is where we play in, right? So for us, um, we do have what we call the crab farming system whereby we can not only farm crabs, but we also can use this facility to help to store some of the products, right? So there are a few things that we could do for the restaurants. One, I don't require my restaurants to take much inventory, right? Because unlike the traditional business model whereby I'm trying to push a lot of products out fast, what I can do with my clients is I tell them, hey, you know, I'm very close to you. There's no point of you trying to take more than what you can sell for the day, right? Just take what you need for the day. And if you need more, I'm very close. So don't worry, right? So we reduce the amount of risk that trade that restaurants that work with us have to carry. And in return, since I'll be carrying the risk premium, I will demand a higher price, right? And that's fair, right? Given the given that all things being equal. Okay. So second thing is so we act like a sort of like supply buffer whereby we keep the crabs alive, 
up to you can sell to them. Okay. Uh, so coupled with our farming operation, this is where the beauty really comes in. If you look at a lot of crab prices out there in the market, most of them will not give you a price, right? They will just say depends on seasonal price. And that's for a good reason, right? Because at the end of the day, they can't print the menu because they do not know what the price is going to be next week. And it's very risky for them to try to commit to a certain pricing and to deliver on them. So they can't, it's very hard to run promotions on an item like crab because the price fluctuation always changes. So what we do with the RAS systems, apart from a fattening, and also to ensure most of our clients have accessibility to price stability. So they can then go and run their promotions for the whole month because I would, I would know when's a good time to buy and sell. And I will also know when it's a good time to keep a lot of farming stock and sell most of my inventory because I understand what are they are trying to do and go. Right? So we build up that value chain towards the end and work backwards to work out our inventory. So that's really important. Take note of this. This is really dynamic in the crab industry. You really have to understand the problems you are trying to solve with restaurants. Yeah. Okay. So let us then move down to shrimp. Okay, so we're going to follow the same similar format. We're going to look at prices. We're going to look at substitution of other products. We're going to look at a B2B or B2C market. Okay, so that's really important. So um, for those of you, I'm pretty sure everybody has cooked shrimp at home. Uh, right, not unlike crabs, yeah, so that's really important. And some of the challenges that are faced by clients, okay. So look at prices. Okay, um... So right now, uh, in Malaysia, farm gate prices, so that means how much my farm is actually being sold to distributors that collects one shot at my place, right? So 50 count sold in, for us in the shrimp industry, we don't calculate by you know, how big is one shrimp. We just tell them how many of it is in a kilo. So obviously, the bigger the number, the smaller the shrimp. So for us right now at the moment, 50 count shrimp, uh, it's at about 27 ringgit. Okay, sorry, that's not 15 US dollars uh, per kilo, right? That's divided by 4, which is about 650 US dollars per kilo at 50 count. Once I go get down to a 40 count, that's about 7 US dollars per kilo. Yeah, what's about the retail pr price like? So, for if I'm buying, if I'm selling this shrimp, like in a place like Eon or NHK, a typically 50 count shrimp will, in KL will go about 40 to 44 ringgit per kilo. And a 40 count shrimp, which is slightly bigger, is 25 gram each, is about 48 to 50 ringgit per kilo. And note that these shrimps are not live yet. Yeah? They are already chilled on ice day, maybe for a day or maybe a day or two, maximum a day and a half on ice. Yeah. So uh, do take note of that. And how much are restaurants actually selling this? So this one is a question mark that varies accordingly. So because shrimp prices at restaurants are not very clear cut, you can just, the next time you go down to any restaurants in Malaysia, go down to order a shrimp dish, usually about, this dish will be about 20 to 30 ringgit, yeah? 20 to 30 ringgit, you know, from my experience, each shrimp should be about one, one to 120, right? So 10 shrimps will be about 12 ringgit plus some of their stuff, they're selling about 40 to 50% margin as well, okay? So take note of this, understand the pricing between farm gate, retail and going into restaurants, right? So that's, uh, that's really important. Okay, so what are other shrimp products out there? Okay, so for us, so okay, so the first shrimp that, to, to clarify, the shrimp that we are farming over at our site is called Baname. This is the Pacific white shrimp, yeah? So out there in the market, there are also shrimps like tiger prawn. Right, so tiger prawn is one of them. So this is the one that has a, a bit of a, you know, what they call belang, which is stripes on the back. Uh, the meat is slightly a bit tougher. And they're usually darker in color after cooking. Okay. We also have what we call the giant freshwater prawn, which is what we call udang gala. Okay. Right, so udang gala. And we also have some other species like chinesis. This is what the Chinese call ming ha in Asia. Okay, so these are usually wild caught, not far. So guess what? Where does Vaname stand in terms of all these prices? So Vaname being farm is usually cheaper than its counterparts like Genesis Mingha, but it's also cheaper than tiger prawns and it's also cheaper than giant freshwater prawns. 
So in terms of substitution, you are already at the lowest point. There's nothing much for you to substitute anymore. Okay? So which gives you an advantage in terms of in the long run, I don't see a big a, I don't see the counts of Genesis getting more and more. It's slightly only going to reduce. And people will have no choice because nobody's going to be willing to pay more and more people are going to substitute over to Paname. So that's really important to take note and understand in terms of the long term. Okay. So what about distribution? Unlike crabs, right? So shrimp, unless you're selling them chilled on ice, right? The only way to sell them live is to require water, to put them in water and transport with reduced temperature. So I'm not too sure for those who are in KL, you probably have seen this really, people actually selling live shrimps out of their high luxes, right? So that's what we do as well. We sell, we sell our live shrimps directly to the right? Um, we expect mortality during transfer, right? We, we know that that's going to happen, but it's not a big deal because the dead shrimp can still be sold for a profit, right? So it's slightly different from the mud crab, whereby once it's once dead, you know, you, you, you lose it. And furthermore, the shrimps that we sell to restaurants, right? If they die in the tanks, they immediately cook. So there are not much of a restaurant, not much of issues in terms of B2B or B2C market in terms of distribution, right? So then your unique marketing channel is what? Okay. So from our experience in the region, right, we see that a lot of people are actually caught getting starting to get a little bit more concerned about what they put inside. Right? So one of the issues that I see is you the usage of formalin or the usage of antibiotics or the usage of chemical to preserve the shrimp, whereby you know everybody's really worried, you know. You know, this shrimp, you know, how long has it been? Is it fresh? You know, is that being preserved? You know, am I eating something with the harmful, a lot of preservative? So, this can be eliminated if you're trying to sell them on a live shrimp, right? So, this is what we actually do. Our unique selling point number one is very simple the shrimp that we are selling is really safe to eat, right? Give an example one of my, one of my staff actually. You know, brought some of the shrimps back because we occasionally have dead shrimps that are dead during the harvest. So uh, I just told them, you know, or dead during the transportation process. I just told them, you know, since it's just dead, you know, just bring it back. You know, we know it's safe to eat. You know, he actually, she actually cooked it for the family members which has allergy, right? So what we realized that is that, that those who have, you know, very frequent allergy with seafood, actually they are okay eating the shrimp that come from outside as long as it is fresh, right? So that's the, our, our, our unique selling point is selling shrimps that are cultured without antibiotics, it's sold to your life, so guaranteed no preservative, and it's sold at a price that is acceptable in terms of market value and in terms of cost and in terms of the overall product or market price. Okay? Can price is also traceable. Number this is a really important concept nowadays is um we are actually ensuring that everybody understands where this comes from. Right. So for us, we actually farm spec right in the residential area. Everybody can just walk in. They know who works there. They know the things that we do. We, we keep our farm very tidy. So that's really important because people understand the value that you put in. Yeah. And most importantly, in the shrimp industry, right now, with our indoor shrimp facility, we don't run through middlemen. We deal directly with the end consumer. Okay. So that's a really important concept. We deal live and the consumer, safe to eat, fully traceable. Everybody can walk through our farm and just buy shrimps. Okay, so that's our, our unique selling point in terms of uh, shrimps in the market industry. Yeah. So for us, uh, so what we do, um, actually RS Aquaculture has been around for some time, right? So we basically we dabble in providing courses for you to understand not just the technical aspects but also the commercial aspects. It can't be just farming, farming, farming without understanding how to sell. We don't understand what business and what restaurants actually need, right? So that's what we actually dabble in. We teach people what are the important things to take note and how do you overcome them in terms of what is your offer, and how do you penetrate to restaurants? Yeah, so this is really important. Okay. Um, so for those who are interested, our shrimp cost is actually priced at thousand six in uh Kuang. Yeah, uh, that's about four hundred US dollars. And it's about 230 for mud crab. This is UN dollars in ringgit. It's about 900 ringgit for mud crab farming. Yeah. But I understand now because of the pandemic, uh, you probably can't travel. So good news, we also have an online version. 
by charging 200 US dollars for the shrimp course and 110 for the crab course. You can enroll them online. Once you enroll, you can access the course and there are forums for you to ask questions, to interact with other people as well. Um, most importantly, after the pandemic ends, you fly over to Malaysia and we will refund you the portion that you have actually paid for in the online course, right? So it will be minus away of your total cost fee. So it's actually just delaying uh, or refunding the actual physical cost. Yeah. So that's all for this session. Um, I'm I'm okay to take some questions if you guys have any. Uh, so take a couple of a uh, couple of things to take note. On the second of June, we'll be have another we'll be having another webinar session on sleep management for shrimp. So for those who are interested in starting your shrimp, that will be a good webinar session. There. All right. So I'll just quickly run through some of the questions we have on. Uh, uh, Facebook. So I got a question from Pamela, uh, trying to sell crabs to Malaysia. Uh, we are right. So I'm sure my colleague uh, Rachel has already provided you with some of the costing that we sell. Uh, take note of that. If it's something that you can match on, we will be happy to. We will be happy to talk to you even further. Okay. Uh, got a question from Vince. Can we farm flower crab as well? Um, yes, you can, but important is to take note that whether your cost can be competitive in terms of um, the ones that are kept from the wild because take note that we are Malaysia is still catching quite a lot of flower crabs from the wild and how would your product fare in terms of pricing you know, versus the ones that are captured from the wild, right? Take note that you have to pay for power, electricity, manpower, fee, taxes, interest, and salt, right? And those guys are catching from the water and pay for it. So, and you know, just capturing the wealth of the ocean. Okay? So that's uh hopefully I've answered most of the questions on Facebook. Uh so if there's no more questions, I think that'll be the end of this sessions. Uh but feel free to drop me a WhatsApp or an email, right? So here's my WhatsApp number, or you can drop me an email if I have further questions. All right. Okay. So um, if that's it, I will sign off now. Um, do let us know if you have any questions. Feel free to drop me a WhatsApp. Uh, thanks again for joining us at today's webinar session. Um, hope to see you again in the next one, and stay safe.